There's a concerning trend in modern medicine that you may have noticed when an average person decides to take charge of their health, to reclaim their health, and they go to their usual doctor, all excited about this, wanting to share what they've discovered. And, and they talk to their doctor about this, and it, it's almost like you're in the Wizard of Oz. You pull back the curtain and say, Doc, guess what I figured out? And the doc's like, no, no, pull that curtain back. You stay around on the other side. And you try to talk to your doctor about your health and about what you've discovered. And your doctor has zero interest in how you've improved your health. They just want to pull out their prescription pad and say, here, you need to take these medicines and stop, stop doing research on the Internet. I thought it might help you guys to look behind the curtain. And I have enlisted the help of a very intelligent doctor who's got a new book out. Uh, let's say hi to Dr. Casey Means. Hey, doctor. Dr. Barry, so, so good to see you today. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, you know, I had your brother Callie on a few months back and he said, you know, you should probably talk to my sister. She is a licensed physician uh, who is just as disgruntled with the way mainstream medicine is practiced these days as you are. And I think you guys would get along just fine. So welcome, welcome to this live. Tell everybody watching a little bit about you and, and what's going on and what, what kind of woke you up to, to there's a curtain here that patients shouldn't touch. Absolutely. So my name is Casey Means. I'm a medical doctor. I trained as an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. So I was deep in the belly of the beast, head and neck surgery in the operating room, you know, 10 hours a day. And it was in my fifth year of surgical training that I had sort of my awakening from the, wiz the Wizard of Oz <clears throat> moment. And what was happening was that I was on like my fourth sinus surgery of the day. I was on my sinus block uh, where we were doing, you know, busting holes into sinuses with drills and sucking out all the pus. And I was looking down at this patient, you know, on the gurney, on the operating room table, looking down at this person and, and kind of just had this like wake up call. Like, I don't really know like why she's actually sick. I think it was her third sinus surgery, her third revision. She just was coming back. We'd given her antibiotics. We'd given her steroids. We'd given her nasal rinses. She'd had the surgeries. She wasn't getting better. And I realized I know how to diagnose this patient. I know how to read the CT scan. I know how to treat this patient with antibiotics and steroids. I know how to do sinus surgery, but like what is truly going on inside her body that is sort of <clears throat> off that is leading to all of this. And so it was kind of like this out of body experience where I, I realized like I was treating all these diseases of inflammation and in ears and throat, but mm -hmm. I didn't really know what was causing the inflammation. We'd never learned that part, you know? And I, I really went down this rabbit hole of like inflammation is fundamentally on the cellular level. It is the body being in fear. It is the body responding to a threat. Inflammation is like our, our army in the body to fight threats. And the biggest blind spot in my training, nine years of training, Stanford Medical School, surgical training, is what is that threat that these cells are responding to? So long story short, that led me on a deep rabbit hole of the last six years to really get to the root of why are so many Americans dealing with chronic inflammation? What are our bodies fundamentally afraid of and all mounting this chronic inflammatory warring response that's leading to most of the chronic diseases we're facing today? And how do we actually fix that problem rather than continue down this road of $4 trillion a year of whack-a-mole on downstream symptoms that doesn't actually get to the root cause? And that led me to really be a metabolic evangelist and warrior like yourself, um, because I think as many of us have come to realize it's it's fundamentally um, the metabolic dysfunction that is so much a root cause of what's causing this sense of threat in our bodies. Yeah. And I want to let's let's dig into that a little bit. Because you had an epiphany standing there looking at this poor patient who was coming back for their third or fourth sign of surgery. What, but the, the majority of doctors never have that epiphany. They are happy to do the surgery, prescribe the medicines, 
and then see the same patient again six months, 12 months, 18 months later and do the fifth surgery. Why did you, what caused you to have that epiphany of, okay, I understand what the, the problem and the moment is. What's the root cause? Why is this woman's sinuses, why are they chronically inflamed? Why are we all chronically inflamed? What do you think? Why, why don't, why, what's wrong with the average doctor? Why don't they ask that foundational question? What's the root cause of all this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of it actually came down to a couple things. One is that I've always been interested in nutrition since I was a child. I've always been fascinated by the power of food. You know, we put 70 metric tons of food in our body in our lifetime. And, you know, <laughs> it's it's like this is not only the building block of the body, it's the it is the also signaling molecules that tell our genes what to do. And when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, I studied nutrigenomics. So I had this priming of like understanding, okay, maybe this 70 metric tons of material we're putting in our bodies in our lifetime, maybe it has something to do with our health, which I'm saying that kind of dramatically because as you know, we are not taught nutrition in medical school and many doctors, including GI doctors who deal with the gut, do not think food is related to disease outcomes. So that in and of itself, even though it sounds so obvious, is actually not built into our system. And so I've always been interested in food. And I, you know, more and more was understanding, like, there are foods that we know are anti-inflammatory. I remember from nutrigenomics lectures in college that curcumin from turmeric literally goes into the cell, changes the expression of the NF-kappa B pathway, which is a master inflammatory pathway. So that's living in me somewhere. And then over here, Surgeon Casey is literally dealing with inflammatory issues every single day as an ear, nose, and throat doctor. You know, you think about what does an ENT treat? Sinusitis, laryngitis, thyroiditis, celluditis, mastoiditis, otitis, uveitis, like all the itises. Itis I'm is itis inflammation. Itis. <laughs> and yep. so I'm thinking, okay, I've got this food knowledge about inflammation, but that is so far removed from my work as almost like an inflammation doctor. W where do these overlap? And then kind of digging into the research a little bit, like, okay, how does diet and lifestyle, how do these things affect ENT outcomes? And realizing there was actually a wealth of literature on the relationship between pro-inflammatory diets and, you know, and ENT outcomes and realizing that nowhere in nine years of training was that ever brought up. It didn't make it into the guidelines because you start digging and it's like they consider it low quality evidence. And, you know, but so a lot of this was kind of brushed under the rug. And then I think the second piece is that I was starting to do, you know, the most dangerous thing you can possibly do as a doctor or as a individual in this country, which is do your own research, you know, dig, dig for yourself. So I was, reading, I was reading the functional medicine authors. I was reading, you know, I started with, and, you know, I kind of took a little bit of a journey because I really started in the plant-based, um, you know, I was reading a lot of the vegan authors, like how to not die and Neil Bernard, Michael Greger, and I am no longer in that sort of nutritional camp. However, what it did for me was open up a new doorway to food as medicine that has now led me down a different path. So it was doing your own research. It was following threads of curiosity. And it fundamentally came from um, a sense that, you know, a sense of just, and you and Callie probably talked about this on your talk, but like something is not working. You know, every doctor I know is frustrated. There is a spiritual crisis happening in healthcare where doctors are burnt out, patients are unhappy. And literally, the more we spend on healthcare every single year, the sicker we are getting. And so, by definition, that's an unsustainable system. And it makes you wake up and scratch your head and say, if that's the case, the more we're spending, the sicker, fatter, more depressed, more infertile we're getting every year, life expenses going down despite more cost, then maybe we're fighting the wrong issue. Maybe the arrow is pointed in the wrong direction. And then what I came to realize is that, yeah, the arrow is pointed on cure and reaction and symptom management. The arrow is not pointed on root cause physiology and therefore we can spend $10 trillion a year. We're not going to get healthier. So it's all about like the work you're doing is turning the arrow towards the right problem, which is inside the cell, 
it is Absolutely. metabolic dysfunction and other core physiologies that are related to most of the symptoms of the diseases that we're facing in the Western world. Absolutely. And I want to say this to all 1300 of you guys watching this, this is probably going to be an important conversation. Please hit the thumbs up and please share this on your favorite social media, because I guarantee you, you've got friends and family members who feel this frustration with their doctor, right? And the fact, if they can understand first and foremost, that doctors ultimately are just dudes and chicks, they're just people just like you. They're susceptible to all the logical fallacies. They're susceptible to the advertising and the marketing, in many cases, more so than just the average person on the street. Uh, and we can get into that if you'd like to. But I, I love that you brought up the frustration that doctors are feeling. Uh, I promise all you guys watching this, your doctor is frustrated. Your doctor is probably borderline burned out, probably borderline depressed, because they are, they are, you, you feel like you're the rat stuck in, in the rat wheel, just running in circles and never making any progress. Your doctor feels the same way. Okay, so please help us get this message out. The, this frustration that doctors are feeling, do you think that that is going to push them towards Dr. Casey Means? Is that going to push them towards looking, trying to even think about a root cause? And I actually love it that you came at this through the vegan route. Yeah. And I tell everybody, every time I have an opportunity, please don't be hating on our vegan brothers and sisters. At least they're aware that food matters. I don't agree with what they think they've discovered, but I think that that's the first step towards adopting a proper human diet is, is going, wait, maybe the food I eat, maybe that's what's causing this. Yes, 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 absolutely. What can, what can patients do if they sense this frustration in their doctor? How can they approach their doctor with, uh, say, for example, somebody's used a low-carb, keto, ketovore, carnivore mm -hmm. diet to transform their health? How would you recommend they approach their doctor and say, doc, what should they say? Mm. I think there's a couple of pathways here. One is, in many cases, I hate to say it, it's scary to say, but you probably in many cases need to find a new doctor because there are going to be a large handful of doctors that are that are not ready to come around to the food as medicine approach and are so indoctrinated in this system that has so many trillions of dollars of of force behind it that literally underwrote their medical education because it's paying the bills of so many medical schools that it's really hard to get that across. And so one, just prepare yourself that you might get sort of like patronized, you know, when you tell them about your success and that's fine. You know, ultimately, you know, your body best. And I really encourage people so much to, to remember two really important things, especially about nutrition. If you are feeling incredible in your body and you don't have any symptoms and you are feeling really limitless in your potential and your power in this life, you wake up feeling ready to take on the world and your biomarkers are in an optimal range, it doesn't really matter what people say to you about your diet. You can feel really confident in that. I'm such an advocate of people understand their own lab work, which I know you are as well. You've written a book about this and also really under being in touch with their own bodies. Because at the end of the day, if you're feeling limitless and your biomarkers are in the optimal range, then you have so much power. So be the owner, be the CEO of your health and approach your daughter, doctor like a consultant and realize they may not come along on the journey with you. You may need to find a new doctor. And if you're going to stick with your doctor, have compassion for them because they are, they are working hard. They are trying their best. They're in a system that is a business that has a very specific, specific dictum, which is uh, to get patients in and out as quickly as possible because that's associated with a better bottom line. And so, you know, just go in eyes open, I would say. Um, but on the, on the, the question of like finding, you know, potentially finding a new doctor, I think that you know, if you are looking for a true partner in that empowered, like more food as medicine, holistic root cause approach, I would really be going, you know, first of all, um, find someone more in the functional medicine, precision medicine, um, someone with some type of holistic health background in their pedigree. So maybe they're conventionally trained, but they've also done certifications in 
you know, functional precision nutrition or something like that, or have, have some, some evidence on their website or in talking to them that they have taken extra steps to learn about this type of medicine. I think that's a great sign. And there's a lot more doctors who are, who are doing that today. Um, but then the second piece I think is just like, of course, obviously joining seminars like this and watch and learning. And a really key thing you can do, I think, is come equipped with a set of labs that you want ordered by your doctor and then a rationale for why you want them. Maybe some printouts, let them know that you understand, you know, that they're not totally normal labs, but like you really want them for these reasons. And I think just mm -hmm. like and, and do it, you know, in a kind way, like and tell them that they want you want the doctor to be your partner in interpreting them. But I think also equip yourself with the knowledge to really kind of interpret them yourself. So I love that answer. That's brilliant. And yeah, uh, I wrote the the book Common Sense Labs with just that in mind, because so many people for me, I think the, the one lab that open pulls the curtain back better than any other is a fasting insulin or a C-peptide. And so many people, when they ask their doctor for that, their doctor's like, I don't even know what that is. You don't have type one diabetes. Why would you even want that? And so in the book we wrote, this is why you want that. And actually here's the, here's the ICD 10 codes that'll get it paid for by your insurance. Yeah, and yeah. so if you, if somebody goes in armed with that kind of information, and I, I love your strategy of being diplomatic, being you know, not not being accusatory, but being like, hey, come on, doc, be my partner in this. And, you know, yeah, humor yeah. me. But when, once you get that set of labs, because not only is that going to improve your health as the patient. But when your doc sees that you have hyperinsulinemia, right. your doc's not they, they're not uninterested in learning. They're going to be like, wait, what is this? What is I don't even know what that means. Let me Google this. And they probably will have to Google it because like this is one of the biggest issues in all of healthcare that everyone needs to be aware of, which is that we in medical school are not really, we are not taught how to truly interpret labs. We learn how to see a green or a red check mark and then assign a medication to individually change that biomarker. But what I've come to understand in my journey outside of the conventional system is that Labs are actually this incredibly empowering set of information that when looked at together, when you look at them as a whole ecosystem that speaks to physiology, and you can read the tea leaves of what they're saying in relation to each other, you can understand so much about what's going on inside your cells and your body. True physiology oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, how are my cell membranes working? That's not at all how we were taught in medical school. It was like LDL is high, you need a statin. Potassium yep. is low, we need a potassium infusion. Like yep. vitamin D is low, here's a vitamin D supplement. It's very algorithmic Robotron. And what I think is a message that you share, that I share, um, is that we are all smart enough every single person on this YouTube live is totally capable of interpreting the tea leaves of your labs and understanding more about your body than we really ever learned in medical school. Um, I think insulin is such an amazing example of that. Fasting insulin, not a routinely ordered lab in pretty much any patient population. Um, sometimes in the type one diabetes space, you know, they might order C peptide, but fasting insulin is really not ordered really very much for anyone. And as you said, I believe it is the, the number one most empowering biomarker we can have. And in the book I do the, in, in good energy, the book that I'm coming out with on May 14th, I do something similar to what you did in your book, which is actually give a paragraph you can read to your doctor to tell them why you want this test. And I'll give it to you here. The, the rationale is that fasting insulin, which is one of the earliest markers of insulin resistance, which is the pathway towards obesity, type 2 diabetes, and nine of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States, insulin levels change 10 years or more before our fasting glucose, which is the standard marker we use in conventional medicine for understanding metabolic issues can change 10 plus years before fasting glucose changes. And in those 10 years, as we are pumping out extra insulin, essentially to compensate for mitochondrial dysfunction, metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, we can keep the glucose in a fairly healthy and normal looking range. And 
So that's, I think that's the important thing to tell the doctor, Hey doc, there was this amazing paper in the Lancet from a few years ago. They know the Lancet premier British medical journal. And it said that actually insulin can change, you know, 10, 15 years before my glucose changes. I know my glucose is okay right now, but I'm really concerned about the rising rates of metabolic disease. I would really oh, love to know if I'm on that early part of the spectrum. Would you be opening to ordering this test for me? And we can, we can, a, a, along with the fasting glucose, so we can get my insulin sensitivity and, and look at this together. Like, I think actually for most doctors, that conversation would probably go okay. And they would probably order. It's a very cheap test, but um, then you unfortunately come into a second problem, which is that the standard reference range for fasting insulin often says that anything less than 25 milli IUs per milliliter is normal. Right. This is totally wrong. I, I would love to hear what your thoughts on optimal range are, Ken. But like for me, I like to see a fasting insulin between like two and six or, or yeah. even like between one and six, you know, we yeah. don't want it to be zero, right? Because that's a sign that your body's not making enough insulin, but really basically like one to six milli I use per milliliter to me is a sign that this body is not having to churn out tons of insulin to overcome insulin resistance, which is fundamentally rooted in mitochondrial dysfunction. And to me, that is saying that so many wheels are turning in the right way in that person's body. And it's a great signal. Yeah, I think anything, any fasting insulin under 10 is pretty damn good. You're probably healthier than 90% of the population. Under five is approaching perfection. That's kind of what I tell people. But I used to give this lecture at, at conferences. And I think if doctors understood the power of a fasting insulin and realized it gives them almost the, almost the magical ability to predict type 2 diabetes five years, 10 years, 15 years before. Before it develops, yeah. before the damage is being done, I mean that's that's the kind of superpower that the average doctor wants. They want that kind of superpower. Why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't you want to be able to say to a patient, "Look, you're going straight down the road to type two diabetes. You're fasting insulin forty five. You've got to cut the carbohydrates, right? You've got to cut the sugar. You've got to cut the highly processed grains." But I, I just don't think doctors understand the power that that gives them. And I love what you said earlier about physiology because this is all physiology this is not a religion this is not this is not some fringe this is basic human physiology and all of us in the first two years of medical school we're taught physiology i mean it's crammed down a cell and molecular biology biochemistry and it, all that stuff is actually the most important thing you learn in medical school but i can remember very well casey starting about year three year four medical school Nobody talked about physiology anymore. There was one thing talked about when there was a problem that presented from a patient. What was the one thing that, 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 that I mean, I, can you imagine as a second year ENT resident, if you started talking about physiology with regards to your patient, rather than the prescription that you were going to write or the surgery that you were going to perform, what would have happened? Your, what would your chief, chief resident have said to you? Oh, well, I can tell you the two things that were said to me, if you don't mind me swearing yeah, on your YouTube no, yeah, live. Yeah. I mean, I, this did come up and I was told two things. You, you're here to be a surgeon, not a nutritionist. And the other thing that was said to me was don't be a pussy. And so just literally multiple, I was said multiple times, but often when I would bring up things about nutrition and lifestyle and root cause physiology. So that's kind of burned into my brain. And, you know, I think about this, that it's sort of like seared, you know, and I think it's so funny. We're so backwards because you think about like, who is the hero in the healthcare system? Like think about, you think about like the pinnacle of the hero in the healthcare system. And that, I mean, that would be someone like a, a heart surgeon, you know, this, this, this older man, heart surgeon at the operating table, cracking the chest, bone saw ECMO, you know, the whole works probably hundreds of thousands of dollars for this surgery. And that would be to, for, for heart disease to basically reroute blood flow from a, for around a blockage for heart disease versus you think about like a nutritionist, like a really, a really good functional nutritionist that we would consider like almost fluffy, lightweight, wimpy, potentially 
And, you know, it's like, you know, just, just such a different sort of cultural perception of those two nutritionist and heart surgeon, but the nutritionist mm. is the only one of the two that has the potential of reversing the heart disease. The heart surgeon is just shifting the plumbing of the heart. And so we obviously need like a complete reframe of how we think about these things. But, you know, as I've gotten more confident in my worldview of thinking, becoming a doctor who thinks about root cause physiology rather than just whack-a-mole reactive sick care, um, I, I've just taken such a greater pride in really focusing my energy on anything that helps me re reverse root cause physiological disturbances in a patient is heroic to me. And that makes me feel the most empowered. And so, you know, I think, um, yeah, I think we just, we just kind of have a lot of it backwards and a lot of that has to do with the financial model of our healthcare system. But as long as we as individuals, I think can wake up to that, we can ask for and find what we need out of the system to support us. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I can remember as a, I think I was a first year medical student and we got the form in class that we could join the American Medical Association. And I can remember even as an undergraduate, I would try to read JAMA and I would try to figure out what the hell they were talking about with all their big doctory words. And when I got that form, I, I literally felt like that, that there was a ray of sunlight from heaven that shone down on me. And I was I was go I was going to be a member of the American Medical Association. And now looking back, I see how foolish I was. Uh, I, I'm no longer a member of the American Medical Association and never will be again unless they drastically change their ways. But, you know, yourself, the average medical student and the average medical resident, they look at the American Medical Association as, as demigods. Oh, my God, whatever they say is the gospel. I need to do exactly what they say. But there are so many doctors who are becoming completely and utterly disenchanted with the AMA. And I would opine that the average doctor in practice, I would I would love to see the books. I'll bet you money that the majority of membership of the AMA is medical students and residents. Mm -hmm. Every doctor who's out in practice are like, oh, they're full of shit. I don't even care what they say. I'm not paying them 500 bucks a year to be a member anymore. I'd love yeah. to see the books. Well, what? Is there any hope for the American Medical Association at this point? Are they are they in any way helping patients or helping doctors help patients? Is that even their their mandate anymore? It's it's so hard to know. You know, I think there's so many forces at play in that conversation. I think COVID had a really interesting, you know, part of it as well. Like, you know, the AMA like it, I don't think it did much to support doctors during that period of time where doctors were just, I think, you know, stretched so thin and the, the spiritual depletion of practicing medicine just was accelerated so, so much. And it's almost like no one was looking out for doctors, you know, it's like just such commodities doctors, you know? And like, I think that you see that, you, you know, you see this in healthcare, like doctors have, I believe I it's the highest suicide rate of any profession, you know, and every single year, like over 400 physicians commit suicide. That's like four medical school classes, just dropping dead. Like there is something really wrong happening. And you would think that the AMA would be like putting on an all out assault, you know, like a whole out war to figure out like, why are doctors suffering so much burnout rates, you know, well above 60, 70, 80% for some specialties, but that's not really happening. You know, it's like, how much can we squeeze out of doctors? And, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah. So I, I think that it's, uh, it's a distressing time, but you know, I have so much, I, I have so much optimism. I really do because there are so many forces of light happening. I mean, the fact that we're even able to have this conversation right now today is, incredible. And the yeah. fact that we are able to have platforms, you know, and when some platforms are shut down, new platforms crop up, like there is amazing ingenuity and light and ability to speak. Um, that is incredible. And I, I mean, there's, you know, over a thousand people in this live, like people are waking up and I think because of the system system we live in, which is, you know, capitalistic 
consumer decision making is going to be one of the most rapid things to change the system. And as more consumers are asking for different things, we see things cropping up constantly. Incredible direct to consumer lab companies like Function Health and Genova Diagnostics and Inside Tracker. Um, my company, Levels Health, which gives people continuous glucose monitoring access to understand their blood sugar levels, you know, all the wearables for sleep and steps and heart rate variability and blood pressure and oxygen saturation. It's amazing. And so, so while the struggles are huge, I think the forces of light are just as strong. And, um, there's a, I think there's, especially after COVID, there's such a desire for, um, a renewed sense of personal empowerment around health that is, I think only starting to come to full fruition. Yeah, I totally agree. I think all the bad things that have happened over the last three or four years, and we won't mention anything specifically because I'd like to keep my YouTube channel, uh, but I think everybody kind of had a little wake-up moment. Uh, all the patients, for sure, but uh, you guys rest assured, many doctors yeah. as well, they felt their backside being exposed. They felt the they were being used. They, yeah. they totally got the, like, I'm just being asked to push something here and I'm not really sure about the science behind that. But many, many doctors had that epiphany over the last three or four years, my friends, trust me, trust Dr. Means that happens. Many, many doctors are aware that they basically got used and abused and then left high and dry. They're well aware. And so there are good doctors out there and I have optimism as well. And I want everybody watching this to understand you've got all the power, really. It doesn't feel that way, but you, you can vote with your feet. You can vote with your dollars. You can vote with your mouth every single day. So I want everybody to tell me in the comments, if you've ever fired a doctor, please tell us in the comments. I want to see how many of you guys have fired a doctor at some point in your, in your patient career, because that's also a career as well as being a doctor. And so for all these people who have fired a doctor and they're looking for a doctor, Dr. Means, what, what's some good tips, good tricks? How do you find a good doctor in, during either before the first interview with that doctor? Because I want everybody watching this. When you go to a doctor's office for an appointment, you're interviewing that doctor. That doctor works for you. You can fire that doctor's ass, okay? Or you, if you feel like that doctor's educable, trainable, you can work with that doctor as your partner, yeah. not as your doctor daddy, not as your medical boss, as your partner. What are some good tips for people looking for a doctor? How do you find a good one? Yeah. One of the resources that I love is um, going to uh, ifm.org's provider directory. So it's institute for functional medicine.org. Functional medicine, of course, is like all about looking at more the uh, root causes to diseases rather than, you know, just symptom-based management. And so doctors who are in that provider directi direct directory, ifm.org, um, are going to have trained in that philosophy. So they have to have a traditional license of some sort, like MD, DO, whatever it is, but then did additional training to really understand that nutritional biochemistry. And like, how do we change the inputs into the body to improve the function of our cells, which is ultimately uh, what you want from a doctor. Improve your function, not just turn little knobs on little biomarkers. That's not, that's not what we want. We want functional cells. So that's functional medicine. Um, yeah. And the nice thing about functional medicine is there's no like one dietary dogma that goes along with it. It's actually more of like a way of thinking. And so you might find doctors who are carnivore or maybe vegan. I think I see a lot of more like omnivorous paleo kind of ancestral diet type type doctors in that space. But fundamentally, they're thinking about the key question in health, which is how do you match the inputs going into the body with what the body needs? Because those two things create function. Um, and so that's one. I think there's another great resource um, for functional medicine doctors called Parsley Health, which is like a more of an online platform for finding doctors. So if you're in a small town and you don't have doctors near you who might be sort of specialized in nutrition, that's a great service, parsleyhealth.com, I believe. Um, and then I actually think social media is an amazing way to find people. You know, you start following certain hashtags or doctor accounts. Um, a lot of doctors who are doing things differently are creating a social presence because they, they are trying to like project and you know, market that they are doing things in a different way and often are very entrepreneurial. So I think actually finding like YouTube, 
people who've been interviewed on podcasts that you like, um, Instagram, maybe Twitter, like my absolute favorite orthopedic surgeon in the world, who's a metabolic focused orthopedic surgeon, he's on Twitter. And he, you know, at this point, if I ever had a knee injury, I would probably try and fly to go see him because philosophically, I believe what he says. I found, you know, on social media, I ended up interviewing him for the, for my podcast and have formed a relationship, but like social media actually is like, I bet a lot of, so many people find you that way. So those are some ways that I would do it. Um, and then of course, ask people who are like-minded, like who their doctors are. Like, that's always a great way to find people. The other thing is if you're Googling, so two other things, I think if you have an insurance company like Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield, you can find your primary care doctor through their provider directory on the website. And there are some, you can also call and sometimes you can search on the website for people who have like the word holistic or nutrition or lifestyle in their profiles. And that's a good way to start finding people who like have a bit more of that leaning. Um, and those are also words I would, I would, act, I would, you know, empower you to like Google if you're looking for doctors. So just like you want those keywords, like nutrition, comprehensive lifestyle, you know, advanced lab testing, these types of words can help you like target it on a doctor's website that might be a little bit more forward thinking. Yeah, How I about any people. other ideas? Yeah, I love ifm.org because, and, and that's not to say that I'm going to agree with the doctor you find on ifm.org, but their, their paradigm, their way of thinking about human health yeah, is going to yeah. be fundamentally different from the, the standard allopathically trained doctor. Now, it doesn't mean I agree with them because what I see many times in the functional medicine space, so you go to a regular doctor, they want to they prescribe you five different medications. Some functional doctors, you go see them and they've got their own line of supplements. And guess what? You need all those. Come on. Come on. That's just a different way of practicing the same kind of medicine. Right. And so not every doctor on IFM.org is going to be perfect. I'm not going to agree with all of them, but it, the paradigm's different. And that's what I love about it. I love uh, these two tips. Find a young doctor. So let's just say you've checked IFM. You've checked my YouTube videos about how to, how to find a low-carb friendly doctor. You can't find anybody. Find a young doctor. Because very often young doctors, just like young people, are not set in their ways. They're willing to think about new things. They still, to some degree, have their student hat on, not just their doctor daddy hat. And so if they hear something that they're like, I've never heard of fasting insulin they're more likely to look that up and go, oh, wait a minute. I didn't realize that. Um, and then also find a compounding pharmacy. Mm -hmm. in your, this is typically a locally owned pharmacy. Don't go to CVS or Walgreens and ask about a good doctor. First of all, the pharmacist doesn't have time to talk to you because they're an hourly employee. They're worked to death. If you think there's burnout for doctors, pharmacists who work for a chain, oh my God, I pity those poor folks. Okay. They are worked to death. They are worked like pack mules. But find a compounding locally owned pharmacy and ask that pharmacist who will still take the time to talk to you because they, they own this. They'll lose this if they're not nice to people. They will say, oh, you want to go see Dr. So-and-so. And, and maybe it's two counties away. So what? Your health is worth you driving an hour, two hours. If you can find a good doctor that can help you figure out the root cause and reverse your chronic disease, I think that's more than worth it. And a lot of people think, Dr. Means, that I'm anti-doctor. And that's, maybe some people think that about you too, but I'm 100% not anti-doctor. Actually, chapter 27 in my book is written to doctors of different stages of their career. I'm like, and so I've had people buy this book for a doctor they fired and actually Dog, dog ear, chapter 27, and are like, hey, asshole, you need to read chapter 27 of this book, okay? Yeah. And so many people have done that. And, and when somebody fires a doctor, think about this as a patient. You fired that guy and you found a good doctor. Now you're in good, you're in good care, okay? But what about all the other patients who are still having to go see the shitty doctor because they don't know better yet? Maybe it's worth an investment to educate that doctor and be like, hey, asshole, what are you doing? You're not helping people. You're literally just paying the bills and keeping the lights on. You're not actually helping people get healthier at all. And I promise you that doctor would probably be hungry to know about 
being able to actually reverse chronic disease. Most doctors are still interested in that unless they're a year or two from retirement, in which case they don't care about anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I, you know, I think that, um, there's such a beautiful thing about going into the conversation with that sense of like, okay, I, I'm not just going to like peace out of here and, and, you know, leave and F you to this doctor, but actually like, is there, maybe they'll never read the book you give them or the article or whatever, but maybe they will, you know, and maybe that could be the first thing that changes that doctor's life and helps transform their world into a much more beautiful world of practicing medicine and then helps all their other patients. So I love that. And I think it's a positive, a real, a, you know, giving your book, you know, give it, sending an article or a YouTube channel that you have resonated with to your doctor. And, you know, there's, there's certainly if that person, depending on how dark it is for them and their practice and how depleted they are, maybe this is the moment where that they actually can hear that and make some changes. So I think that's, I think that's incredible. <laughs> Absolutely. Because you, you always have two choices as, as a patient, you can either change your doctor or you can change your doctor. And I, we've had so many people in our private group, Casey, who have been able to change their doctor, meaning change their doctor's mind because they got them to order the fasting insulin. And then the doctor's like, holy crap, I didn't realize I'm going to start ordering that on all my patients. Yeah, because yeah. when you change a doctor's mind like that, now you've actually improved the care of however many thousands of patients yeah. that that yeah. doctor sees each and every day for the rest of their career. And that's a very powerful thing. One of the first things that people do when they join our private group is they, they put where they live in the world. Hey, I'm in the Seattle, Washington area, and I'm love to find a doctor who understands root cause medicine. And then we have, you know, there's 20 or 30 people. They're like, oh my God, yeah, I see Dr. So-and-so. He's over on Smith Street. Yes. Boom. Guess what? A doctor who understands functional medicine, metabolic medicine, root cause medicine, all of a sudden they've got a full book. They're booked out for months because people... Talk, they vote, voted with their mouth, didn't they? They're like, yeah, you don't want to see that guy. You want to see this guy or this gal. Boom. All of a sudden, that doctor's practice is flourishing. And guess what? That doctor's not burnt out. That doctor's having a great time because that doctor's actually helping people be healthy and not just enriching big pharma. And most doctors, are they're very interested in that. What, what about the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association? What's your take on what they're doing? Is the American Diabetes Association, are they ever going to come out and start actively promoting a low-carb diet for people with diabetes? I have to say, I have just been almost universally disappointed with American Heart Association, their take, for instance, on seed oils. <laughs> the American Diabetes Association, not in any way, shape, or form, taking a relentless strong stance against refined grains and sugars. It's all very wishy-washy on the website, you know? And then other organizations like the American Cat of Pediatrics, which you just look on the website on who is paying their bills, and it's a bunch of processed food companies that make formula and childhood foods. And then you look at the guidelines, and all of a sudden, oh, those things are fine, you know? And it's like, so I, I think that um, I really am just so disillusioned with these organizations because they almost universally are willing to take money from the companies that are causing the problem. It's a revolving door. Um, and, you know, you look at some of these papers and um, that they put out and the guidelines and the statements. And what just astounds me is like, why would these organizations, let's take the Di American Diabetes Association, not be every single day on every single platform screaming from the, the rooftops, stop eating any refined sugar or refined processed grains. Just never eat it again. You know, they do nothing to support your diabetes. They do nothing to help your metabolic health but everything's all opaque. You know, you want to have balance and moderation in your diet. We want to make sure, you know, we're eating complex carbohydrates. Like, and I'm, I'm not like a super low carb person. Like I, I, like I, I'm not fully, 
there, but I, I don't think that the human body needs a single gram of refined white wheat flour or refined added sugar in a lifetime. It doesn't serve our health and they absolutely ultra processed foods directly contribute to obesity and diabetes. So why aren't our medical leaders being evangelical about these messages? It literally, I mean, this, this keeps me in Cali up at night. This is why you wrote the book. It is perplexing. Yes. And so, you know, the ADA as recently as the last 15 years has taken money from Coca-Cola, from Cadbury, from several other processed food companies. So you have to follow the money. Um, but I, I, what I want to see is just unequivocal clarity from our medical leaders saying you need to be exercising, you know, you need to be lifting weights. You need to be walking regularly throughout the day. We need to be managing our stress. We need to be just absolutely eliminating processed foods, just shunning grocery stores for carrying these yeah. terrible products, 70% of the shelves yeah. and talking about the ridiculous amount of environmental toxins that are poisoning our mitochondria that are being spewed out by industry. Like yeah. they have a voice and they're not using it. And that is shameful. So, that's oh, and so it could be argued because, you know, it's, it's so uh, through the looking glass that many people, they get they get conspiratorial thoughts. They're like, so you're telling me that the American Diabetes Association takes millions of dollars a year from Kellogg's and Post and Kraft Heinz and Mondelez every year. And then they tell me, a diabetic, oh, just eat everything in moderation. Eat the rainbow. Here's some recipes where we actually say, yeah, add some sugar to this cucumber salad as if a cucumber yes. needs some damn sugar. And, and you're like, I don't blame people for being conspiratorial. It's like, how could you? I, I kind of get it. Like the, the American Diabetes Association starting tomorrow morning could literally break the back of the diabetes epidemic in America starting tomorrow morning if they tweeted and, and, and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and said, hey, guys, Stop eating all the added sugar immediately if you're diabetic or if you're pre-diabetic or if you have metabolic syndrome or fatty liver. Stop eating any added sugar at all. And also stop eating highly processed grains. Stop all that. Stop that immediately. And your diabetes will improve better, faster than any prescription drug at the pharmacy. Do you know what that would do with the diabetes epidemic? It would change it. It would change because it immediately overnight. And they have the power to do that because most people, most doctors trust the ADA. If the ADA said that, and I've reached out to Dr. Bob, their spokesman, multiple times on Twitter. It's like, hey, come on my YouTube channel or I'll come on your Ask Dr. Bob Live. Let's talk about this because diabetics need to know this. Crickets chirping has, is all I haven't heard a word from them. It's like they have no interest in breaking the back of the diabetes epidemic curve. They have no interest, evidently. What, what what other message am I to take from from their lack of of doing this? What what should we take from that? Yeah, I think it's I think the the unfortunately I think it has so much to do with financial incentives, and I I don't I and I don't I don't even necessarily think of that in a nefarious way because I think what what it's. I can absolutely get down the conspiratorial road, but I also just think on the bigger picture when everything in our culture of health and medical school and even nutrition research down to the NIH at every level, there is the ability for industry to influence the way things are thought about and what research get done gets done and what's in the curriculum. So it's, it's not even, I don't even, this Dr. Bob, like, he might not even know, you know, I mean, true. Like I, I do like, he just literally might not have a worldview in which he can understand the harm that's being caused. And, you know, if a nutritionist from day one is trained to say, and to believe we need our plate to be balanced, you need your quarters, you know, starches and you need this and that, like it just, it's truly, I think what they believe. And then different opinions about nutrition start to look extreme to them. And when things are extreme and scary, you can demonize them. And so then there's all this warring. And it's like, I just think it's so built in that, yeah. it, you know, maybe there is a big agenda. Maybe it's just on every level, the, the 
there's good people in a bad system that's pushing us towards just, just the wrong information. And so it takes a lot of, I think, confidence on the part of individuals and doctors who defect from the system to stand on two feet and like actually say like, I think I'm right. And I actually think this whole multi-trillion dollars of industry and people who have 10, 15, 20 years of higher education, that they're actually wrong. That's hard, you know, but I think (laughs) the proof is in the pudding, right? Every functional medicine doctor I know, or doctor who practices food as medicine, their patients are thriving. They're thriving. They're, you know, people are getting better. People are getting off medication. Every, almost every conventional endocrinologist or primary care doctor I know, their patients are not getting off medication. There are endocrinologists I know who have never had a patient get off their diabetes medication. So the proof is in the pudding. And I think there's a lot of empowerment and confidence that has to go along with this to be able to stand. And, um, but again, when you are feeling limitless, when you are feeling incredible, and your biomarkers are in an optimal range, who really cares what the system is saying? You know, you, you have the receipts and that's why I think it's so important for people to take control of their own lab testing and really develop the stillness and quiet in their life to hear their body, to hear what their body is saying to them. Cause the body has the answers. The body's telling you every day what it needs, what it wants. It's how it's doing. That's symptoms, that's moods, you know? And so if we can tune in to listen to that and understand our biomarkers, like you said, we have all the power. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, let me be clear. I don't, I don't believe there's a conspiracy. I think that it's just the perverse incentives. And, and so here's what I dream about, Casey. I dream of a day when Dr. Bob goes live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter all at the same time. And he says, I want to show you guys something. Here's the check that we just received. Here's our annual donation from Kellogg's for $800,000. We're not going to cash this check. We're going to send this check back uncashed because we don't want their money. And and what we want you, uh, the diabetes community, to take away from that is you shouldn't be eating anything that Kellogg's makes. We don't want their money. And you shouldn't eat their products. I dream about something like that happening one day. And, and I'm going to jump up and down when it does. I'm not going to hold my breath for that because I think it'll be a few years. But that's the kind of message that people with diabetes need to be getting from the American Diabetes Association is don't eat anything that Kellogg's makes because it's going to make your diabetes worse. But we yet we, we still haven't heard that message. So somebody has found a doctor. And they're like, I think this guy may be okay. This gal may be, maybe they're aware of metabolic health. Maybe they're aware of root cause. What are some questions? That first appointment, you're sitting there, the, the doc, new doctor walks in the room, you shake hands. What, what's on the list of questions that you're going to ask this doctor to vet them, to see whether you're going you're gonna to allow them? Because that's what it ultimately winds up being, a patient allowing this person to be their doctor. What questions are you going to ask this new doctor? Well, I think the first thing I'd want to look at is some of their patient intake forms. Cause basically you want their patient intake forms to be like 30 pages. Like you want, if they're asking about your childhood trauma and whether you filter your water and how much sleep you're getting at night and whether there is light in your bedroom, I'd be like, heck yes, this person is clued in. They're e- they're looking for the things that matter. You know, what are your relationships like? How do you cope with stress? Are you in therapy? Like I've seen patient intake forms that look like that. And so that's a signal that this person is going to be basically digging under every nook and cranny of my life to understand the various vectors that we know impact physiology. So that's number one, just like look at their patient intake forms. If it's a, if it's a two-sided page with little check boxes of like, do you have these diseases? What medications do you take? What is your family history? Leave literally. I mean, maybe stay for the first visit and see what they actually ask you. And then the second question is, you know, I haven't thought too much about this question, but I love this question, Ken. I think one question that comes to mind is like asking them about what success looks like to them. Like what would constitute a successful doctor patient interaction to the doctor? Yeah. And I would want to hear one thing. And that is 
we reverse your diseases. We reverse the symptoms that you're feeling. You over time move into a state of health that feels incredible and powerful and that we are you know, testing the things regularly that help us understand whether your physiology is working properly inside of your body, like something like that. I don't know. There, there's only, and then I think the second thing is, you, you know, you want, so asking the doctor, what does success look like to you and making sure the answer has something to do with your body truly healing, not that they want to just, you know, turn knobs on your biomarkers, but that they are committed to your cellular thriving. So I think I would ask them what their framework is on nutrition, 100%, um, what their training is and like what kind of interest they have in nutrition and what their philosophy is on that. I would want to understand um, what a healthy interaction between the patient and doctor looks like to them. You know, I'd want to hear that doctor tell me something about, you know, they believe they're your coach. And they are your supporter, but you, the patient, are ultimately the CEO. And you, the patient, are ultimately the decision maker. Something around that. So, um, and then I would honestly just like get down to brass tacks. Like, uh, what do you consider to be a great panel for understanding like baseline health functioning and metabolism? And I'd want to hear things like fasting incident, yeah. insulin, advanced lipid panel, uric acid, GGT, liver function tests. HSCRP, vitamin D. Like I want to hear about triglyceride to HDL ratio. You know, I want to, I want to hear about those things, you know, thyroid TSH plus thyroid antibodies plus T3, T4, all these things. So I, I, I basically want to hear them say that they actually look deeper than the standard lab tests that were taught in medical school. So how about you? Any others that I missed there? No, that's, that's brilliant. Just that alone. If, if people walk away with that, write that down, what you just said. And when you interview a new doctor, if you don't hear that kind of stuff, you're probably going to strike out with that doctor. The, the, if the doctor, if one, okay. So I want doctors to start practicing more like veterinarians. When you take your dog to the vet and the dog has some kind of chronic condition, chronic skin, chronic gut, chronic whatever, the first question is, what are you feeding this dog? Like, it's common sense. Duh. And you get somebody with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, and they go to the doctor and the doctor's first question is, what medicines are you taking? Come on. Come on. What the hell? That's yeah. So what what are you feeding this patient? I, that's one of the first questions I want to be asked. And I want that the, the answer to mean something. If the doctor's like, oh, you got to stop eating all of that. That's your problem. That's what's causing this. Yeah. So the, the diet questions got to be in the first five questions asked or I'm not interested yeah. in that yeah. doctor. And that doctor's not truly interested in helping you achieve your healthiest self. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Means, this has been absolutely brilliant. Close us out. Give us a summation. Tell people just how much power they got. Help people understand there is a solution. There is hope. There, You should be optimistic about your future health, your future self, the future of our practice of medicine in this country. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think everyone listening should have literally nothing but optimism. There is, we live in a time when there is more access to information, tools, technology, lab tests, and even doctors uh, who understand root cause health than probably any time in human history. And while the system benefits off of our not asking questions, blindly trusting, you know, and, and, uh, feeling disempowered, we have the choice every single day to wake up and just, you know, reject that and to be empowered and to really understand the truth, which is that a couple things. One is that chronic disease is not inevitable. Most chronic di diseases we're facing in our country today are almost totally preventable. And with the knowledge you have today, with the knowledge you have from just basic understanding of eating real food and nutrition, you have the ability to drastically decrease your chances of developing 
chronic diseases. And so, um, you know, and also just remember, like, like Dr. Barry said, like, what are we feeding the dog? You know, there are so many aspects to, to, to diet and lifestyle that are important, but fundamentally that three to four pounds of food that you eat every day, the molecular information, three to four pounds that you put in every day, 70 tons in our lifetime, that is our greatest form of power. We get to make those choices every day. And the more we can focus on real, whole, unprocessed, nutrient-dense food from really good soil, the happier and healthier our lives are going to be. So I think if you take one thing away from this, it's just like eat real food. <laughs> that is going to be one of the key gateways to um, reaching our highest purpose in this lifetime. I love that. I love that. Dr. Means, thank you so much. Guys, I've linked all of Dr. Casey Means' links down in the show notes. Check it out. Buy our book. It's available on Amazon. And I'm pretty sure there's an audible ride for us ADHD guys. Yes, That's there is right. an audible. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, doctor. We'll have to do this again sometime. Thank you. Bye, everyone.